Hi, everybody. I'm Sher, Chair of Design for Social Innovation, and I'm here with Jane Engelbar, our faculty member. And we're going to have a conversation, a little bit different format, in this webinar in the series about designing success. Um, Aaron has asked me to remind you that the hashtag is DE4SI, which is on the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to tweet your hearts out. Um, Shay Engelbart is one of those people that I can't say enough good things about, but I'm going to try. Um, I met Jane when I had an idea for something I wanted to do, and someone said, you have to know Jane. And I met her, and it was the first time I had ever had somebody understand more fully than I did what the potential of the idea was and have such a grasp on exactly what I had to do to make it real. So Jane is every every person with an idea, every, every idea's best friend, and she understands the distance between having an idea and making it real in the world better than anybody I know. She knows how and when and how much it takes to get ideas to touch down. So I'm thrilled that Jane is on our faculty, and uh, she's an incredible resource. So Jane, <laughs> we're, and we're going to have fun. You've been a grant maker and a management consultant and a CEO, and now you're an executive coach to CEOs. What is it in all of that that you've learned about social innovation? In 40 minutes. In 40, in 40 minutes. minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, what you just described that I do so mm -hmm. nicely is that I'm much more an idea doula for other people. You have a great idea, and, and I can hear in those potentials. Uh, but uh, it's a little bit difficult for myself, um, so I have some notes here that I'm going to use, so it'll keep me from asking questions, which is usually my, my way of doing things. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my background. and. Uh, a little bit about what I think will make people successful at social innovation. So I've been very lucky uh, in the education I've received both formally and through my career, I've had some pretty exceptional experiences. I've had the opportunity uh, through management consulting to be to get to know more than 100 organizations. I have talked with CEOs about what they want and how they've made it happen. I've been a CEO myself. And then I've been able to experience up close what works and what doesn't across industries, tax exempt and corporate, and what it means to grow something around the globe. So I've had a really wonderful opportunity to see and learn a lot of things. And it's changed the way I originally understood what makes for success. Uh, when people talk about social innovation, I also notice there's some misconceptions. And a lot of them are misconceptions I had when I started. In, in the industry. So I first I'd like to define what my definition of social innovation is and my understanding of what it means to be a successful uh, social entrepreneur. And then I'd like to go through sort of the five most common misconceptions that I hear when people share their ideas with me. And so, people can type questions and add misconceptions to those as we go along. <laughs> misconceptions are welcome. And I welcome questions. We'll probably do that at the end of this. Uh, but I, it's so important that we share a language and we share an understanding. Uh, I have experience with a, uh, in the movie business with a nonprofit executive and a movie executive using the word development. And if you know anything about nonprofit organizations, development is where you ask for money. And in the movie business, it's where you spend money. But they thought they were using the same word. And you can imagine what the impact of that was on their budget. So um, I'm going to try to use my language so that you understand where I'm coming from on this. Uh, social innovation, for most of the things that, I, that I've read, is described as discontinuous change. But I don't think that's the whole story. I think there are two kinds of change. One is improvement and adaptation. That's where you know the system. And you're finding elements to tweak it to make it more effective. You're making it bigger. You're making it smaller. Maybe you have a different way of bringing in um, a, a supply chain, or it's really just you know uh, iPhone to iPad, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's just a larger size, but it has a slightly different use. 
To me, innovation is reframing from the very initial purpose. What assumptions in our value and values do we associate with a product or a process? So it starts with the question, what's, what are we really trying to accomplish? And it, very, it requires you to step all the way back and ask, why am I doing this? For what, toward what end? Um, so if you imagine that your x-axis is knowledge and your y-axis is time and experience, okay? People's knowledge doesn't follow a straight line. It's actually more like a step. And the, the inflection points, the little risers in the steps, happen when you see something in a different way than you've ever seen it before. And it applies all of the knowledge you have. And that's why you grow in that way. And so to me, innovation are those moments, the ahas, where you go, oh, I never thought about it that way. And then all the other knowledge you have is added to that perspective. And it gives you a whole new way about thinking about things. So to me, uh, social innovation is the application of reframing assumptions we have with better ways to improve society's well-being. And there are people with special abilities to reframe. And that's, those are people who see opportunities where others don't. They have a heightened ability to imagine relationships among ideas, processes, structures, and people, which I understand now to be design thinking. So I learned that. Um, that they feel a personal responsibility to make things better for others. They take very personally. They will take, it's not just that's wrong. It's that I need to fix that. Something's wrong, and I need to do something about it. They have relentless curiosity. They ask a lot of questions, and they love to solve problems. They're fearless in implementation. And what I mean by that is that all issues are resolvable. Never ask whether or not this is something that can be done. They're sure it is. They just have to be persistent and willing to adapt, and there will be a solution. And they're great storytellers. They have an exceptional ability to propel others to action through their stories. And they have drive and passion for success. And what I've just described to you for you are social entrepreneurs. And what I learned when I came to this program is that there's an incredible group of faculty who know how to do this. Can I interject and say you also just described yourself? Oh. <laughs> Um, this group of people at uh, the Design for Social Innovation is a, is a group that sees opportunities and is really willing to talk to each other, even though we have very different languages. I learned design thinking because I come from a business background. And I understood what it meant. It was just another way that I described innovation or described development, leadership development, for example. And so what I think is amazing about this experience is we're going to have all these people with different backgrounds coming together, and that's when the inflection points happen. So uh, there are a couple of other things I wanted to find because they get used a lot when talking about social innovation. Um, and I have a slide with these words on it. Uh, social enterprise and social venture often get confused. And I understand social enterprise is an organization that engages economic forces in bringing about social change. So the focus of the organization is social change, but it uses economic forces. It can either be tax exempt or not, doesn't matter, but it's things like the Grameen Bank, uh, mm -hmm. Mohammed Yunus, or Feed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, its purpose is social. Social venture tends to be more traditional corporate business in which social good is a benefit. So it might be a corporate social responsibility or method or a product that works in a corporate way but also has a social benefit. An entrepreneur is actually an entrepreneur and hopefully a social entrepreneur that works inside a structure. And that's where innovation can happen as well. So these are all places that innovation can happen. And a change maker, because we need them all, are people who make it happen. There are people who want to participate in making it happen, and no one can do this alone. I wanted to say one thing about nonprofit organizations, because they often get left off this list. Imagine being known as not. You're not a male. It's sort of ambiguous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think that 
we are better off when we talk about what it is. And what it is is a corporation. 501c3 is a corporate tax code. It is simply a corporation that is tax exempt. It has very specific reasons that allow for private wealth to benefit social good and therefore not be taxed. It can be charities, it can be foundations, it can be universities, it can be animal welfare. Have fun, read the law. It's really interesting to see the list of things that were chosen to be tax exempt. It, social innovation happens there too and has been happening there for many years. And so it's important to know that you can find social innovation in all of these places. Are we ready for misconceptions? Absolutely. Erin, uh, do we have any? Great. Okay, the first one is, we're all in this together. Hopefully, yes. But actually, right now, no. Sorry. <laughs> This is something that I actually learned in business school, and I thought it would be better now, and it is somewhat. But um, as someone who started out as an art historian, going to business school is like landing on the moon. Uh, I really learned that people think differently. They see the world differently. They have different assumptions about what matters. And the sooner we learn that, the better off we'll be about bringing change in the world. Um, yes. Everybody will be affected by global warming and poverty, but they don't necessarily think about it all the same way. So it's most important, the most important thing you can do to be successful in your venture is to listen and to make room for participation of people who don't necessarily think the way you do. Really listen, no matter how critical they are. They have a point of view, something else matters. Uh, learn their language, what matters to them, how they make decisions. Um, there's I, heard, I heard a wonderful expression that fits here, which is that we all have unlearning to do, just as we have learning to do. And I think that is relevant to your point about listening. I think that there, we shouldn't be frightened by other people's language. Mm -hmm. Ebitda, which is a, a, a term that people in finance use to indicate value of a company. Mm -hmm. And it, it means earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization is a tool somebody uses to evaluate. That's what they use to evaluate value. You need to know that if you want them to value what you're doing. You need to know what they do with that. So um, one of the most fascinating things, I think, about meeting the faculty was how different our language was and how intimidating some of the language was to each other, technical language versus financial language versus design language. Yet, if we all stood and understood each other, we began to see the connections between them. So I think it's incredibly powerful listening and inclusiveness and really listening because there are values underneath and things that matter to different people. They see the world in a different way. The second uh, misconception is we just need to make people aware. I wish that were true. I really wish it were true. Um, there's a lot of science around human behavior that will be part of what we teach here about uh, what helps bring about change. Awareness is the first step, and it's just the first step. There are, sort of, there are four stages when you are uh, creating an organization that you want to bring about social change. And, and you need to think about a change in awareness, which is what people think, a change in attitude, what they feel. People are feeling beings. You need to reach their emotions. They make decisions very strongly by emotions. Change in language, what they say, how they talk about things. Change in behavior, what people do with their attention, their time, their money, and their influence. And you not only need to know what change you want, you need to know what the replacement behavior is. What are they doing now? What is it that you want them to do and why? How can you make it matter to them? And matter to them is really the key. Because it's, it's what they call the with them, the what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. 
that is the crux of this. When you think about the very successful changes that have happened, whether it's the movement to stop smoking, or um, I had a wonderful grantee, now it's almost 20 years ago, uh, named Mark Friedman, who start, wrote a book in the very beginning called The Kindness of Strangers. And what he recognized was mentorship is an enormously powerful thing. And he realized that there's this whole body population of people who are of retirement age who have lots of knowledge. And then there are all these young people who could use the advice. Why don't we put those two things together? The people's prejudice about what old people were were like discarded people. Right? What value did they have? And so he had to really think about what, how would he make that uh, a value? How could he show that value? And at the time, I was a grant maker. Many other foundations were funding older people or older adults or what we used to call elderly and their health needs. But people weren't funding the opportunity for them to contribute to society. And so that was a whole change of our values and the way we see people. And now we call them Encore Careers. And he's written several books on prime time and the most important part of your life. But it really took that period of him understanding what people were thinking, what he wanted them to think, and how he's going to make it important. And he happened to make it and happen during the carpet, the baby boom, where we're all growing older. So we all have a good self-interest in that. Not our students. Yeah, not the students, but knowing that about the context. So knowing the context is really mm -hmm. important. Um, they had the same issue with not smoking. We all knew it was bad for us until we learned about secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke was about us. So knowing the what's in it for me mm -hmm. and knowing what change in attitude, in awareness, attitude, language, and behavior you want to make, mm -hmm. what is the behavior you want? Because ultimately, it is people's attention, time, money, and influence that brings about the change. So uh, next slide, how are we doing on time? We're doing pretty good. Um, this one I hear a lot. Uh, my, this is completely new. There's never been anything like this. You've heard this too, right? I have it indeed, yes, I have heard it. And I have to say, thank goodness this one isn't true. <laughs> <laughs> and thank goodness everyone can't change the world, right? It really is that. Social entrepreneurs are people who find similarities and patterns and things that other, others don't. And that, in fact, is key. Uh, yes, it's important to have a unique selling proposition, which is what they call it in business, but a unique proposition for what you're doing. But what you need to look for are the similarities, not the differences, in order to learn and grow your model. So if, you, if something you're doing doesn't look like anything you know, then ask yourself, what are the people you want to do this doing instead? Because that will be your competition. So if they're going to the movies mm -hmm. instead of doing something, then you should look at movies. I mean, you really need to look from the point of view of who it is you're trying to influence and what are they doing and what is it that they would value because what matters to them is the key. So. Um, you need to think upstream, and I'm gonna, I have a little time, so I'm going to tell a story, upstream story that many people may have heard, but some people haven't, and it's a good story. Uh, these stories, for some reason, are, these parables are always very biblical. I don't know why, but they, have, they feature people like Rebecca and Naomi in them. So Rebecca is uh, by the river. She's washing her clothes in a river by uh, some stones where she can get the dirt out of the out of the clothing. And it happens to be right near a waterfall where the, world, where the water is most turbulent. So right beyond her, about three feet, it drops off into a waterfall. And she's watching her clothes, and it's a beautiful sunny day. And she looks up the river from uh, where the water is coming down from the mountains. And she sees the sun sparkling on the water. It's a beautiful day. And as she looks up the river, she sees that there's something coming down towards her. And she can't quite see what it is, but as it comes up alongside her, she begins to see that there's a basket in the river. Hmm. 
And as it comes right next to her, she looks inside the basket, and there is a baby, a live baby, in the basket. So she panics, grabs the basket, and puts it on the side of the riverbank, and calls to every other person in the village to come see that there was this baby in a basket coming down the river. And all of the women in the village run to see what's happening and to see the baby. And uh, Naomi says to her, well, where did you find this baby? And she points up the river. And as she does, there's something else coming down the river. It's another basket. And it comes alongside. And there's another baby in the basket. And then sort of just as they look up more and more babies in baskets, so every woman in the village is in the water pulling the babies out of the out of the river as fast as they can. And they're just besides themselves working so hard. And Naomi gets up and starts to walk away. And Rebecca says to her, where are you going? She says, I'm going up to the river to find out who's putting babies in baskets and putting them in the river. I want to know why they're doing it. And I want to see if I can get them to stop. That's upstream thinking. Uh, to give you an example of how that applies, if you were to put waggle tails and furry feet on the baby and make it into a dog or a cat, animal welfare organizations have been rescuing animals for 100 years. Those organizations are 100 years old. They have been taking animals out of the river as fast as they can, putting them in cages and getting them adopted. To rethink that industry, they needed to understand why does that happen? Why are people putting these animals in baskets? Do they, do they not understand how to care for animals? What's wrong with when animals get adopted? And what was a likely industry? Foster care, right? We used to have orphanages. We don't have them anymore. Why? Because we know that families are a better environment. So if we use that same thinking and we start to think about animal welfare as foster families, you'll see that that's beginning to happen in the industry. Because living in cages is not good for anyone. So what if we made families? And what if we educated the families? And what if we showed people, just the same way they do with babies, how to care for your baby? And so that's an innovative way to think about an industry that's been an industry for a long time. But it requires that you take a break from doing this. And it's not to say that you don't continue to do that, but that there needs to be somebody who rethinks it from a we need to save these victims problem to a how are they becoming to this place in the first place problem. And that's the innovation. It was reframing why are we doing this towards what end? What's the purpose? How can we get people to stop? So that's, that's an example of uh, sort of, there's something like it, but you might not, not in the welfare and in animal welfare industry, but actually in the child welfare industry. And in, when you do your history, you'll realize that actually animal welfare came before child welfare. Who knew? They protected mm -hmm. horses before they protected children. Um, I'm keeping quiet. OK. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is. Um, this one I hear quite a bit, which is we're in the business of doing good, not making money. This one's really important, because um, whatever you do, you're in the business of creating wealth. And money is just a currency for wealth. So it's not anything to be, to be intimidated by. Um, you're going to be creating human capital, maximizing your resources, doing social good, and you need to know the hard skills. You actually really need to know the hard skills about managing money, about revenue streams, financial ratios, effective operations in order to be sustainable. If you're going to have an organization that is sustainable, you need to know the nuts and bolts of mm -hmm. business. Um, there's a lot of knowledge here. Uh, I, you know, you translate it. You use it and you translate it. Uh, the uh, economies are different. The way in which money comes to you, earned income versus contributed income versus any of the uh, quasi or, or, or hybrid models, changes the economy of what you do. So, but knowing the different economies is really helpful in terms of innovating your own economy. Um, 
I remember in business school I learned about total quality management. And from somebody from the nonprofit sector, I thought, oh, gee, that's all the stuff we have. Right? Total quality management is an investment in what you are doing because you care about it. So it was a perfect exchange because what the organizations needed was systems and what corporations needed was the connection to mission. Mm -hmm. There was something that was such an easy exchange. So no one is expert at everything. So if that's not your strength and you're the entrepreneur, um, hire somebody who does, who knows, who cares about those things. But know enough so you know who you hire. And uh, be sure that you share the same priorities and what matters. And the last, um, the, the last sort of misconception I think that people have is uh, it's not what you do, uh, it, who, they think it's, it's what you do, it's not who you know. That's not true. <laughs> okay, it's the corollary to number one. You need to know people. You need to know a lot of people and you need to know a lot of different people. Because you can't succeed if you're going to try to do this yourself. This uh, you need to be able to talk to people who aren't like you and understand what matters to them and help bridge the gap between what matters to you and what matters to them. Recognizing that corporations, institutions, and governments, they're organisms made of people. They're just people. They may look like a big building, but they're people. And the more people contact, the more relationships you can have. These are not transactions, these are relationships. That's what brings about change. And no one, no one does it alone. So those are my five misconceptions. Fantastic. Can I ask you a few questions? Sure. So it strikes me that you are such an enormous wealth of knowledge and that what you know are all of the things that we all need to know in order to create sustainable lives in design or using design. So can you talk about, because you talked about listening, what is it you listen for when you hear someone with an idea? First thing I listen for is what drives them. Usually there's an event or a passion or a value or something that they're completely intolerant about, mm -hmm. which is the key. You have to like a bee, this a bee, can't, a bee in the bonnet. This is right. <laughs> I, this can't, this yeah. can't go on. Yeah. Or this must happen. Well, why? I don't understand why. This is so obvious. That's the first thing I listen to mm -hmm. because that tells me where the driver is and where they're coming from. And it tells me uh, what it is that they think needs to be different in the world. Mm -hmm. And then by asking them questions that are not usually asked, mm -hmm. they can begin to see the whole picture. Very often we can only see what we can see. We have a blind spot. We all do. And so we, it's opening those windows to what ifs. If it wasn't impossible, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you wanted to get there, what would be the first step to that? Sometimes it's just somebody asking those kinds of questions that break open our, our self-limitation. Mm -hmm. um, what they've done so far, what if they researched really good, successful uh, ideas are researched, and I don't mean researched like focus group research. I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> it is what else is out there. Yeah. Knowing your context. Knowing about the people, the place, uh, talking to real people mm -hmm. about their experiences, that's also, and it, very often connecting people mm -hmm. to stories that will resonate with them. Is there a character they need? A character. There's a lot of character um, traits they need to have. Uh, persistently curious. They have to always be asking questions. Not self-doubt, necessarily. I mean, they should be asking, does this make sense? Did this communicate? How does that work? Those kinds of questions. 
parents. They have to be. There really needs to be a willingness to take responsibility, but a willingness to share leadership with others. Mm -hmm. Because social change is a shared experience. And it's not about self-aggrandizement. I think that what one of the best kept secrets um, in the United States is that foundations have been doing this very quietly for many, many years. They do it. They do it quietly. They do it with long-term thought. And they have helped create so many innovations. But they just are quiet about it uh, because they don't. it's not about them. It's about the betterment of the world. So I think that that's an important mm -hmm. characteristic. I hear in what you're saying a lot that has to do with reframing questions. Um, throughout what we've said um, and throughout conversations that we've had. And it's something that's central to the design process, too, that um, the most important thing is to make sure that the right questions are being asked in a big picture and a small picture. Is that? It is. And then the other thing that I feel about design that fits this mm -hmm. is that it only works if it works. It's practical. Mm -hmm. So once you ask those questions, can you make it work practically? What are the nuts and bolts it will take to design this thing that feels good in your hand, that gets you to do it in a particular way, that changes the whatever it is? Mm -hmm. That, and design is one of those amazing things that motivates people. I mean, you know, just the, it, it responds to how you think and how you feel. And so to be able to make that into action, it's amazing. And that's the thing that I think is most difficult for in business that it seems to be so natural in design mm -hmm. is the thought to practical is just really magical process. I love it. That would be Erin talking from behind the camera. The off street voice. Um, Karen Thulner wants to know you said that people are in business to do good, not to make money. I like to do good, but I also have to make money. I can't and don't work for free, and I'm always amazed by the number of people that think I do. How do you suggest approaching a client that scoffs at your rate? I think both of you. Doesn't it depend on your rate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, and, and, and I said that as a misconception because yeah. I, we I totally agree. We're all in favor of making money. Right. Um, money is about value. So when people scoff at your rate, what you need to do is think about what value are you communicating to them. So what matters to them? It may not be what matters to you. Uh, there was a time where I um, worked on a program that that um, used professional performers in the hospital. Clowns in the hospital. And um, you can imagine how much hospitals really wanted to pay for that. <laughs> so whether or not the core of the program was what was important, what, what the, because it was important, what the institution needed to know about it, that was beside the point. We needed to make a value argument that worked for the hospital. Mm -hmm. So feeling good is good for you. We know this. Right? And um, my favorite quote is one where the clown gets into the elevator. He's dressed like a doctor. And he gets in with a doctor. And a doctor says, ah, clowns don't belong in the hospital. And he says, neither do children. Oh. Don't you just love clowns? They're the best. Anyway, um, we were able to using the IRB, which is actually the official review board for scientific study, prove that having the performers reduced cost of medicine, the, uh, had children comply more with hospital procedures, relieved tension, had a better experience, all of the things that they needed to measure. And what I, I do is explain that what does the customer that you're working with you want to charge this amount? What do they value most? 
how can you deliver it to them in their language, in their word? It may not be what you value most about it. I mean, I value the creative experience and, and the talent of mm -hmm. these performers, but I knew what the customer needed. With the customer in that case was the person who was paying, which is it's important to know who your client is. And you know, the hospital was willing to pay once they could evaluate it to their goals. So that's what I would recommend. And understood the metrics. Yes. In a way that they can repeat to the people that they work for. Yes, absolutely. So what is it that's most important to your client? And how can you communicate value? Super great. The other one is um, Nicole Dinsher 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 with them, with them, which is the abbreviation for what's in it for me. Yes, with them, what's in it for me. And it's really important to know the what's in it for me for the people you're talking to. You um, included in your misperceptions the, the notion that um, this idea has never been seen before. But in all the ideas you've seen, has there been one or two or three that have been really, truly new? The best ideas are the ones where you go, oh, that's so obvious. Yeah. Those are actually the best ideas. The ones where you go, huh? Why hasn't anyone ever done this before? And I remember that there was an organization that decided that was a problem with mentorship because like big brothers big sisters because they always had a first job mm -hmm. and so whenever somebody was mentored if you had a business engagement then the person that you were mentoring sort of got pushed to the side mm -hmm. and was like well why don't we just make it somebody's job it's like <laughs> of course <laughs> why not it's a full-time job well then it's their first priority duh it was just one of those it's like yeah what a really good idea and it was the same with Mark Friedman when it was like, uh, there are these older people who are looking for things to do, and there are these young people who need advice. It was just sort of, so I actually think the best ideas are the ones where you just go, wow. Mm. It's just, that's, if it's, if it's that much, there's, then it's, mm. it's, there's something else there. It's more convoluted. Mm -hmm. You have to simplify it. And simplifying it, I think you and I have discussed how important it is yeah. to break something down. It's very, very hard, but it is, it's the key to break it down to its simplest components so that you can communicate. Mm -hmm. You have, I'm assuming you'll just yell out if you have. Absolutely. You've talked about Mark Friedman several times. Just to give people a sense of how you do what you do, are you willing to talk a little bit more about the role you played in that whole, and maybe explain yeah. what he accomplished? Yeah, he's, he's, uh, I met Mark Friedman when I was a grant maker. And uh, the kind of grant making that I did was what I think now is, like, there's a name like social investment now, or new venture investment, or whatever. But in those, what we were doing was we were finding small programs that had great promise and help them build their structure and capacity so that they would be well prepared to get large grants, because we were not a big grant maker. And, uh, Mark had one program. It was at a school in Philadelphia. Maybe it was second program because he started out in San Francisco. And uh, it was the beginning of demonstrating how you could bring together a volunteer a group of volunteer people and actually build great wealth in a school. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would benefit both. And uh, that experience what you know getting to know him his plans that organization is now that original thing was called experience forum that organization now is something called the purpose prize it is all uh, and it and encore careers and there's i mean it's global but it was really about it started out small and i think that that's critically important as people think about these things you don't envision the whole thing up front it, you find something small um, and I think Mohammed Yunus tells the story about how he gave money to one or two families first. You start with a small thing, and then you start to see how it grows and you adapt. 
So now this is a global organization that really motivates uh, society to value uh, people of retirement age as a resource for building wealth in our communities. And whether it's, it's and these people get paid too, <laughs> you know, the different, on these programs. And he's had enormous impact, right? He's had a huge impact. Okay, I think our, our whole attitude is about people who are over 50, we don't think of them sitting in a rocking chair retiring anymore. They all are contributing. Mm -hmm. And we don't see it that way. But 20 years ago, we might have. 20 years ago, there were people that once you retired, you waited. Mm -hmm. But we have extended life, and these are people with great knowledge. And America has always been very embracing of younger people, but we are now embracing people as they grow older for the value that they can bring. And so you sort of left yourself out of that story. I, I noted. <laughs> I would love it, and to the extent that you're comfortable, to, to have people understand the the transformational role. So pretend it wasn't uh, you. Pretend it wasn't uh, you. Pretend it was someone who did what you do. Right? Here's a guy yeah. with a passion and an idea. And, and you know, this is what grant makers generally do. They do not very differently than somebody who was um, investing in a company, they ask a lot of questions. What are you thinking about this? How would you, if you were going to expand this, what would you do? What would you need? How would you get the money? Uh, how are you measuring whether or not this is making a real difference? Mm -hmm. uh, how are you managing the quality of the volunteers you bring in? What kind of education are you providing? What kind of uh, uh, screening are you doing? I mean, it, it is mostly somebody who has a lot of knowledge from other fields and asks the key questions. Mm -hmm. But it is, in fact, and Mark and all of his staff, I mean, he doesn't do it alone either. I talk about him because he's a magnetic personality and he was the first person I met. But his entire staff all contribute to this mm -hmm. and to those answers and the development of those answers till he's grown this organization. And and they're you know and he said leaders beyond in different parts of the organization. So it is it's the opportunity I think which is why I refer to myself as an idea doula is that I ask all those questions mm -hmm. and I have a sense of where to find the answers. Yes. But it is it is the connection of people and mm -hmm. ideas mm -hmm. that create that. So. Um, I got to witness it. Mm -hmm. Is my best role is that I, I get to be up close and learn from it, and I ask a lot of questions. And you make connections. Yes. And you know from experience how to prevent someone opening 24 doors when there's one door that is actually the path that will be most efficient to get them where they want to go. Yeah, we, you know, you think through all the options, mm -hmm. and you, but you lay them all out, mm -hmm. and then you have to keep going back to, so towards what end? Mm -hmm. and, and that's mm -hmm. the driver question, which is, okay, so what is the ultimate goal? Mm -hmm. And to never lose sight mm -hmm. that the solution you have for today, this solution, should be, re, you need to readjust and rethink. I mean, mentorship was the first step, but it's certainly not the step he's involved in today. Right. There's a much bigger step. I mean, these are innovators. These are people who are, he's really leveraging this portion of society to be so much mm -hmm. that he's discovered along the way. So, you know, it's, it's nice to be the one asking the questions. Fantastic. We are... We're almost there. Yeah, almost time. out of time. But if anyone has questions, now would definitely be a good time to put them in. Um, you, can you talk just for a couple minutes about, you, we, we talked about, in general, grant making and consulting with CEOs. Can you talk a little bit more about sort of the stages of your life and experience in education that got you here? Yes, only looking back can I draw the straight line. Okay, okay. so it was not, it, 
uh, I think it's important to follow what you love mm -hmm. and what makes you curious. Uh, I started out in art history. I loved art, and um, I wasn't as much an artist as in I had the ability to see, which mm -hmm. was different than making art. Mm -hmm. And so I became an art historian, and in the time that I was doing that work, I worked at the Museum of Modern Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, in the Wall Street Journal, there was something called the Sotheby Index, where they used to like value art as money. I didn't quite understand how that worked. <laughs> and uh, someone told me that I uh, had an analytical mind, which I hadn't known because I'd been in the arts. And I went to business school. And that, sort of, that was sort of the big change for me, was beginning to understand that I had two parts mm -hmm. to the brain mm -hmm. and that I could translate between those industries. And so I started to translate those industries to each other. And that was great. And then I realized that within those industries, there were board members and there were foundations. And so there are different players in different industries mm -hmm. and different languages. Right. And so what, I mean, there, there are just certain words like audience, constituent, customer, that get used in different industries that have similar meanings. So how do you explain them to each other? And so I started to do that work. And that led me to, to apply what I knew about business to the creative mind. And through that, um, that was through groups. So it was sort of not, I spent some time at KPMG to keep my work because I really felt I needed to know numbers so I could understand numbers. And that was definitely a round peg in a square hole kind of experience. But it, I met a lot of interesting people and I learned huge amounts. And that bringing those together as I've done this and then also had the opportunity to be CEO of two companies is um, that leadership is the key. To me, uh, the, the leader, understanding leadership and the skills of leadership, uh, and that you can have those skills at any level in an organization is critical. And so uh, people's behavior, how they behave, what motivates them, what persuades them is the key, I think, to bringing about social change. And so that's how I develop this now, is that I work with leaders who have great ideas and want to make more of it. And that invaluable, invaluable series of lenses from every side of all the issues you've dealt with is what makes you such a remarkable guide and a mentor to leaders. Thank you. No, thank you. And I that's it. Do you want me to say anything else? Please stay tuned to the schedule of webinars. We have some really exciting things coming up. And join me in saying thank you to Jane, the amazing Jane. Thank, thank you. you. And one last note is that we are still accepting applications for uh, fall 2012. And applications will be open soon, actually, for the next year. We have an amazing scholarship opportunity. If anyone out there happens to be from Buffalo and is a woman. Any Buffalonians? Buffalonian nets. And we have a bravo from one of our listeners. So. Thank you. Thank you.